I'm going to go quickly into um, the word tonight. Um, this month's theme, we're, we're talking about Babel, a natural attempt to enter God's presence. And my topic, I'm um, concluding from Sunday, my topic is beware of constructing a spiritual tower of Babel. And we're going to do a quick review tonight. And um, my base text is coming from Ephesians 2.89 Amplified. For it is by God, I'm sorry, for it is by grace, God's remarkable compassion and favor drawing you to Christ that you have been saved, actually delivered from judgment and given eternal life through faith and his self. And this salvation is not of yourselves, not through your own effort, but it is the undeserved gracious gift of God, not as a result of your works, nor your attempts to keep the law so that no one will be able to boast or take credit in any way for his salvation. And on Sunday, we took a look at the history of Babel. And we all, we know the story, we're familiar. Most of us are anyway, are, are familiar with the story of the Tower of Babel. It's found in Genesis 11. And um, the project, the building was actually a symbol of the pride and arrogance of, of people who were trying to be like God or be equal with God. And that story again is found in Genesis 11, 1, 4. I'm gonna read that, Genesis 11, 1 through 4. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east and they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had bricks for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city in a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. And we can see that the people were seeking the presence of God, but on their own terms. And that originated from Adam and Eve. We'll talk a bit, little bit about that here in a few minutes. And the word Babel, most of us know the word uh, babbling, and that's where the word babble comes from. It means to confuse or mix. And in the Garden of Eden is where all of this confusion and mix up originated. Adam and Eve created a spiritual tower of babel. And, 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 and we saw too on Sunday, their, their language was one with the father, just like the Babylonians, they spoke the same language initially. Then here come, again, here comes to the confusion after they decided to take matters into their own hands. They thought that they could reach God on their own terms. And, and we're like that too, right? They got tricked to enter, Adam and Eve, they got tricked into entering the presence of God or trying to be like God, but by a strange voice, the serpent's voice. They were already in the presence of God. They were made in his image, the Lord says. They didn't need anything else, but Eve allowed the enemy to come in, to creep in and to deter her from what God had established. And we gotta discern, be able to discern what's sent from the enemy, amen? We say a lot of church lingo and I receive it and I'm blessed and highly favored, but we really gotta do better with discerning what's sent from the enemy. I think we can save ourselves a whole lot of, uh, from a whole lot of um, trouble and and um, and and chaos if we if we just get in His presence, stay in His presence, not on our own terms, but seek the presence of God from a place of um, 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 truthfulness, um, in spirit and in truth, and we'll be able to discern what's sent from the, what's sent from the enemy. But a lot of times we got to do it our way, and it costs us time, and it causes us to go around. Um, the same dysfunctional cycles and patterns, just like the children of Israel. And Adam and Eve, we see, allowed a foreign voice to come in and tell them something different from what God had already spoken for, what God had already established. And we know we can read this story in Genesis 3. The enemy, um, his voice, it placed doubt and uncertainty, and it caused Eve to place uh, her focus on the tree. Then she started looking at that thing. She started looking at that tree and it created a desire, a lust that didn't line up with what God had said, amen? And there were spiritual and natural repercussions. And the serpent was right about, you know, some of the stuff that he said. The eyes of them, they were both open as he said. And they did know as he said, but it didn't produce the God-like power and the wisdom that they wanted. And it merely, like Elder Johnson was saying, I talked about Sunday, it merely just brought on a sense of inadequacy, inadequacy and shame and fear. And thus the fall of man, amen. That one decision cost them their lives. 
And just like the people of Babel, they became alienated from God and separated from each other and they became subject to death. And we should, we should be imitators of God. However, we gotta see ourselves in the right position in relation to God, amen? And we, and we looked at human attempts to achieve glory, just like Adam and Eve, Eve just like the people of Babel, um, it, it won't work. Uh, all the glory um, belongs to God. And, and when we try to, um, to attempt to achieve our own glory or try to attempt to uh, enter the presence of God on our own efforts, we always uh, fall short. Uh, we were created for his glory. Um, he's not present for our glory. Isaiah 42 and 8 tells us, I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to carved images. And um, we, we looked at John 17, where, where Jesus, he prayed for all believers. He prayed for the 12 disciples initially. Then he prayed for all believers in John 17. Um, and, and we find that our glory is not in doing things as we like, but in doing God's will and being obedient um, to his will. And, and, and um, my focus was looking at um, various groups of people who were so attached to entering God's presence on their own terms. And we started with the uh, young rich ruler um, whose story can be found in Luke 18. And we looked at him and um, the ruler's life was revolved around his riches. You know, they were at the center of his life. And Jesus was like, hey, you know, if you want to follow me, you know, get rid of that false God, get rid of your money, get rid of you, uh, uh, your philanthropic efforts, you know, trying to um, um, be in my presence, get rid of those idols. So and put me at the center of your life. It's not he was telling him it's not contingent upon your money because the man was sad when Jesus was telling him the things that he needed to do. Look, um, give away your money and come follow me. And he was sad because all of his hope, all of all of, of, of what he knew was, was, was tied into that money. And we talked about just being a good moral person won't get you in the presence. Jesus said, no one is good anyway. Amen. <clears throat> the ruler has said he kept all of the commandments, commandments since he was a child. And, um, you know, we're so filthy. I don't, I don't care how, how much money we give, how many alms we do, how good and righteous we think we are. We are still filthy in God's eyes. Amen. And only the blood of Jesus can make, can make us whole and can, can wash us to where we can enter into the presence of God. And so we will, um, we will begin tonight talking about another group of people who tried, who thought they could access God's presence through their own efforts. There were various uh, sects or groups of people. There were Jew Jewish parties vital to church organization and administration in the, um, in the New Testament times. We have the Pharisees and the Sadducees. There were other groups, the Herodians, um, the Zealots, the Sectarians. But for the purpose of this message tonight, um, we're going to conclude, we're going to focus on the Pharisees and Sadducees. And let's look at the, take a look at the Pharisees. And we know about the Pharisees. Um, Pharisees, they were an ancient Jewish religious sect who laid the foundation for what would become rabbinic Judaism. And the name Pharisee um, actually means separated ones. And I want y'all to take, uh, take note of that. Remember that uh, the, the, the name of Pharisee actually means separated ones. They preserved and advocated for the importance of oral tradition, which is the Torah, which was believed to have been handed from God to Moses. They were also known as a political group to influence government leaders and stir up the people to carry out their political agenda, which was directly tied to their desire to preserve Judaism and the identity of God's people. They controlled the synagogues and they exercised much control over the population. And so while the Pharisees affected Judaism in many positive ways, their adherence to oral to tradition is often portrayed as overly legalistic and in some cases a means of circumventing the law. And we know, they were, we all know they were opponents of Jesus. They saw the way to God as through obedience to their law through their own effort, efforts, amen. And they opposed Jesus because Jesus refused to accept their interpretations of the law, which came into conflict with the new covenant, which was Jesus's message, amen, the gospel. They constantly, we know, we, we read, we, they constantly tested Jesus and tried to trap him in blasphemous statements or something that could be interpreted as a threat to Rome. 
And as, Je as Jesus was accumulating his disciples and his followers, and those followers begin embracing his interpretations of the law, he presents a greater and greater threat to true Judaism and the political party they needed to normalize. Amen, y'all follow me? And as it relates to keeping the law, their actions were for performance only, the Pharisees, and it was only for the praise of men and for show. But Jesus saw beyond he saw way beyond their pomp and their ostentation and called them out for who they were. And he upset their ideology. We find in Luke 11, I'm gonna read Luke 11 verses seven through 44. Jesus was invited to a Pharisee's home. I'm gonna read verses 37 through 44. And as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and sat down to eat. When the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he did not first wash before dinner. Then the Lord said to him, now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and the dish clean, but your, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also, but rather give alms of such things as you have. Then indeed all things are clean to you. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manners of herbs and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like graves which are not seen and the men who walk over them are not aware of them. Jesus was saying, you're doing all this performing, but you, you're doing all this performance. You, you, you're doing all this outward show, but you're, you're, you're nowhere near me. The Torah, which you adhere to, the, 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 um, the, the law that was uh, spoken down from generation to generation, it pointed directly to me, but you can't even see it. We may be tithing, we may be clean on the outside, um, got it going on in the natural. We may even have titles, but Jesus is saying, all that won't get you in my presence. Come on, somebody. What about your heart issues? What about your motives? What do you, why do you do what you do? See, La. What about your rituals, your devotion time? Is it something that you do to make yourself feel better? Is it something that you do to get brownie points with me? Come on, is it something that you do to make you feel entitled to receive blessings from me? If you do this, then, then you know that I'm gonna do that. Is it something, is it just something that you do for you or is it for me? Come on, somebody, see la. Jesus told the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew 15, eight, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain, they worship me teaching as doc doctrines the commandments of men. Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. We hear that all the time, but what, and we say it often, but what does this actually mean? The, it means that the predictions, the prophecies from the prophets concerning Jesus would be realized in Jesus in the coming of the Messiah. And then he lived a perfect life. He fulfilled the moral laws. And in his sacrificial death, he fulfilled the ceremonial laws. He came not to destroy the old religious system, but to build upon it. Come on. He came to finish the old covenant and to establish the new. Amen. And this is what the Pharisees, they couldn't understand and they couldn't accept. And Jesus disrupted their entire tenets and convictions in their entirety. Primarily that they in themselves, the Pharisees, they had nothing to do with entering God's presence or receiving salvation. Amen. I hope that made sense to you all. And the third group we're going to take a look at is the Sadducees. The Sadducees. I heard Apostle, when he was preaching one time, he, he called them sad, you see. Sad, you see. I thought that was, that was an awesome um, play on words. The Sadducees were aristocrats. They were the upper echelon of society. society. They were the party of the wealthy and of the high priestly families. They were in charge of the temple and its services, but they opposed the oral law, but they accepted the Pentateuch. Now, the Pentateuch, some of us know, is the first five books of the Old Testament um, of the Hebrew Bible. And unlike the Pharisees, they didn't believe in the resurrection or life after death. And they tolerated no threats to their position and wealth. So they strongly opposed Jesus again. And they were in opposition to the Pharisees. However, watch this, 
even though they didn't like each other, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they didn't like each other. They came together for Jesus's demise. How many know your enemies and their enemies will gather together to conspire against you? Selah. In John 5, Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath and he provoked a confrontation with both of the parties, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he, and, he, and he had it out with them. So we see that how often they, the, both the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they came together to go against Jesus. They didn't like each other, but they would come together to, to go against Jesus. And how sad for both of these groups to, of people to be in the very divine presence, the very raw presence of God in the form of his son, but not knowing who he really was. Amen. And we talked about joy last month and how befitting a segue into this topic, man trying to attempt to enter into the presence by religious and legalistic efforts. There's no joy in religion and legalism because once I get through doing one thing, I gotta try to perfect the next thing. Come on somebody, and it's never enough. Our own effort will never be enough to enter God's presence. It's about relationship through the blood of Jesus. Jesus came to give us a rest from our works according to Hebrews 4, 9 through 11, Hebrews 4, 9 through 11, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for anyone who enters, <clears throat> a, a, I'm sorry, for anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience and their um, here in the scripture is a reference to the children when they were disobedient and complaining against God in the wilderness. We know our generation died because of, of that, the complaining and the mur murmuring against God. Amen. And in Old Testament law, the Jews were constantly laboring to make themselves acceptable to God trying to obey the do's and the don'ts of the ceremonial law, the civil law, and so on and so forth. They couldn't possibly keep all those laws. I think one time I heard a, 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 a preacher say that, um, or I read somewhere, maybe a comment here, there were over 600 and something um, laws. And so who could possibly keep all of those laws? So here comes the various sin offerings they will offer up for forgiveness and restoration. They had to continue to offer sacrifices, amen. But we know that that was a temporary system. That was a foreshadowing of the once for all sacrifice for our great high priest, Jesus Christ. In Christ, there is a labor to rest, but it's a rest in him. We were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. We can't enter through our works, but only through the blood of Jesus. But we separate ourselves just like the Pharisees did. Remember, Pharisee means, Pharisee means separated one. We separate ourselves based on our own efforts, based on our works, based, we call ourselves holy. Come on, we call ourselves good. We call ourselves righteous. And we gotta be careful with the scripture, the prayers of the righteous avails much because we can think we're doing a thing through our works and not base it on the righteousness that we have through Jesus Christ. Come on somebody. And it can produce arrogance and haughtiness. And these traits are only a stride being holy, being good, being righteous. They're only ascribed to us through the blood of Jesus. Jesus only makes us righteous. This separation we place on ourselves is based on our carnal terms. And this carnal separation, it causes strife. Come on, it causes discord within our homes. It causes confusion. It causes dissension in the body of Christ. We see it, we see it. It causes biases and prejudices. The Samaritans, they didn't like the Jews and vice versa. Come on, the blacks don't like the whites. The Mexicans don't like the Puerto Ricans. You better not call a Meta, uh, Puerto Rican a Mexican. <laughs> you be, they'll be ready to fight. God says, when, but, but God says, when I separate you, it's on my terms. It's for my glory through the blood of Jesus. There's no distinction between Jew and Gentile. Hallelujah. I'll gather them together in one family under my name. Hallelujah. When you call on my name humbly, I will answer. Humble yourselves and call on the name of the Lord, not seeking glory or trying to make a name for yourselves, not on your own efforts, not the mind trying to make you, not trying to enter in my presence in your own way. And I make you one family. Glory to God. No denomination can cause you to enter in. There are many people that have turned away from Jesus Christ because of the division 
in the body of Christ in the form of denominational barriers and have confined, they have confined themselves. Come on. And people look at us, they look at the church, we, we fight and competing amongst ourselves through, uh, through various sects and they see the bitterness that arises and the church is not the witness that Jesus would have us to be to compel men to come. See law. Come on. No racial class can get you in. Your divinity degree can't get you in. Come on. No title can get you in. Your gift of prophecy won't get you in. Your gift of tongues won't get you in. Come on. Your word of knowledge won't get you in. It's not based on your testimony either. It's not based on your rituals. Belonging to a particular set can't get you in either. It's not based on you looking sideways at another culture. With Christ, all God's children, we gain equal access to him through Christ. And through Christ, worship becomes a matter of the heart. A matter of the heart. It's an inside job. Not external actions. Not what I can do. Not how good I can pray. Come on. Not being over the intercessory team. It's directed by truth rather than legalistic ceremony. John 4, 24 says, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Then I got one last point. One last point. Judaizers in the province of Galatia, they argued that Paul's gospel was incomplete without the law and that the real gospel required Gentiles to be circumcised and to keep other aspects of the law. And, and Paul wrote a response. He wrote a letter to the church of Galatia. In Galatians 5.2, I'm reading from the contemporary English version. He wrote, I, Paul, promise you that Christ won't do you any good if you get circumcised. What's Paul saying? He was saying, long story short, he was telling that if you think your circumcision and works are going to get you salvation in the presence of God, there's no need to believe in the finished worth of, worth of Christ, work of Christ because it's based on you and not God and not Calvary. Come on, and, and the same with us. Amen. And in closing tonight, in closing tonight, man's natural attempts to obtain God's presence, our works and rituals are never enough. They will never be enough. We can never do enough to be saved. We can never do enough to enter God's presence. We can never pray enough to be saved. Come on, somebody. We can never pray enough to enter God's presence. We can never give enough alms. We can never give enough uh, to charity to get into God's presence. It has nothing to do with us. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And he allows us to enter into the presence. Come on. He tore the veil, remember? We didn't tear the veil. Come on, somebody. He tore the veil. Beware of constructing a spiritual tower of Babel. Our own efforts can't grant us access to God's presence. And lastly, in your own private study time, I encourage you guys to read about Cain and Simon the sorcerer. I'm and I'm sure there, there are countless others in the, in the Bible from the Old Testament to the New. And look at how they tried to enter God's presence on their own terms. God bless each and every one of you tonight. And I thank God for his word on tonight. Amen.